Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Howard Coe. It's my great, great pleasure to see you all and to interview a very esteemed guest today, the Honorable Adrian Todman, the Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or a HUD. Big round of applause for the Deputy okay. Secretary. Thank you. <laughs> and Madam Secretary, it's great to see you because I think it's fair to say that the interest from the health side about housing issues has never been so high, especially at the school. That is correct, and that's a good thing. I welcome it. <laughs> so we're looking forward to hearing from you and learning from you. Mm -hmm. uh, and to start, people may not know that the Secretary has a lifelong interest in addressing issues of affordable housing and community development way before she assumed this high-level position at HUD. So uh, to start, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about your background, sure. how you got drawn into this work, and because HUD is so big and complex, if you could also tell us to begin, what are the three top things you want everybody to know about what HUD is and what HUD does? That's great, thank you, thank you. And thank you for the invitation. It's great to be okay. here with everyone. You know, um, my housing journey was not an intentional one. Um, it, it, uh, it, it was a complete happenstance. I, I began my professional journey on Capitol Hill. I, I graduated um, from Smith College, which many of you may be familiar with, and left there and moved to Washington, D.C. Um, I interned on Capitol Hill and uh, left there and moved over and worked at HUD, but how I got to HUD uh, is uh, something I hope will bring some other younger members of the audience uh, some, some hope in terms of what their professional um, journey might be. Uh, I had applied for uh, a job at OMB, Office of Management and Budget, uh, in the, at the White House, and also applied for a position at, at HUD then in the 1990s during my first, my first journey there. And I received a call from OMB, a uh, job offer, and I was like, this is great. It's a job offer. Keep in mind, I'm like 26 or 27 mm -hmm. years old. That context is important. And I got this job offer. I was all ready to go to OMB and do there. And HUD called two weeks later and offered $15,000 more. Mm -hmm. And my housing journey began. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it's been a wonderful one. It's meant to be. And uh, after my, my first tour, uh, at HUD, I was there while I was there during the time of um, Henry Cisneros, so I think has been uh, just a wonderful, forceful leader in the housing space for so many decades and was um, really excited to, to serve while he was our secretary. And it was just an energized place, so many new ideas, and it was inspiring. And I thought, wow, this housing thing is, is more than $15,000 worth more. It's, it's, it, it, it really impacts people and communities in ways that so many people don't realize. And so I got the bug then. And um, that just started a whole career. I moved there and uh, uh, did some consulting work helping local public housing agencies figure out what their redevelopment plans were. I landed at the DC Housing Authority and had an incredible career there doing a number of different things that's informed sort of the way as a practitioner I look at the policy making that I'm able to take on and uh, led a national housing association, which taught me the rest of the country. It's a big old wild country out there with mm -hmm. lots of different people and lots of different thoughts about this work and many other things and was very, very pleased to be able to, to serve in this administration as deputy secretary. So it's been a great journey and one I relish and I work around amazing people um, in Washington. And tell us more about the three top things. The three top things <laughs> about you, HUD, absolutely. Everyone should know about what HUD is and what HUD does. Certainly. So um, HUD is a, has a very rich mission. I like to tell anybody that I don't think there is any community uh, in the 50 states and U.S. territories that is not impacted by HUD's work. Um, that, is, that is our breath. Um, not only do we help with rental assistance, in all of its forms, both in terms of our voucher program, our public housing program, our privately owned assisted work that we do. But we also help with um, helping uh, with the homelessness continuum, um, both providing cities and states with funds um, to help um, homeless individuals, um, but also helping folks who are at risk of homelessness as well. But we have this huge body of work that's inside of our community development space. 
that, that really is where we are really impacting folks across the country. We have our Community Development Block Grant, which provides local leaders the opportunity to do community amenities. Um, we also have the HOME program, which helps to build housing. We do health care facility financing, which is usually the first question on the pop quiz about what HUD does. Most people don't realize that we actually have a mortgage tool to help health care facilities be built in areas, uh, both urban but particularly rural, that where they otherwise would not have been. Um, so we do a lot of work. Um, and it's not just in housing, it's also just making sure that individuals inside a community are able to live in a place that is thriving, and we do that a number of different ways. Great, you have a broad mission. So every day on the news, we're hearing so much about rising costs of home ownership, of building homes, rising rental costs, uh, lots of studies. We have some colleagues from the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies here, and they've done a lot of that work. Uh, one piece of news I just saw recently is the average rental household is spending 30% or maybe even more of their income yes. on rent, which is like a, a very unsettling milestone. So affordability is just a major issue in this whole area. So t tell us more about how you and your colleagues at HUD and others are, are trying to address this. You know, um, one of the reasons I'm thrilled to be with this administration is um, from day one, issues around housing was at the forefront. Um, early on in 2021, it was really centered around responding to the impact of the pandemic and making sure that we were keeping families housed, whether they were renters or homeowners. And so that centered a lot of our work. But we also know we needed to have a dual track. And so housing affordability has been an issue for, for many years now, and, and particularly here in Boston. Right. And so we began early on, began to strategize on what does really pumping the housing supply look like? What are the levers that the federal government has or needs to get so that we can just simply build more housing? Uh, and not just rental housing, but um, affordable home ownership as well. And so, uh, so some of that work uh, uh, was manifested in the President's Housing Supply Action Plan, which we released in May of 2021, which was really a all-of-government approach. While HUD has housing in its name, um, we are not the only federal entity that really um, has equities in this space. So we have our partners at USDA that has a lot of work in the rural space, our, our friends at Veterans Affairs who helps veterans not just from homelessness but also um, home ownership as many of you may be aware. Um, Treasury, uh, you know, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program mm -hmm. is one of the major forces for um, you know, housing supply across the entire country. Mm -hmm. um, CFPB for tenant protection. So we all got together and came up with an action plan that not just spoke to things that we needed from Congress, but also things that we can do because we are the federal government and we are going to do it. And so we've partnered with Treasury to really reinvigorate some of the programs that we've had with them, with what they call their federal financing bank. Um, we have sat down with VA to be more intentional about making sure that we're housing um, homeless veterans um, with urgency. Um, we are working very closely with the USDA to make sure that our programs and USDA's rural programs are braided together a little bit more closely so that developers in those areas of the country are able to, to build and build affordably. So we have been, this administration has been just, um, just driving and, and in fact, just a couple weeks ago, although days are turning to weeks and turning to months, we <laughs> also refreshed our housing supply plan and introduced a new concept, which is our brand new program called Pro Housing. It's a $85 million program, um, which we are really continuing to motivate states and, uh, and uh, localities to reduce the barriers to to more housing supply, whether it is creating new zoning rules, um, whether it is coming up with new ideas around innovative housing types like ADUs. Um, we're, we are driving um, and accepting applications from leaders on things that they want to invest in to mm -hmm. continue okay. their supply mission as well. Great. So to state the obvious, all these forces are now converging on this national homelessness crisis, which mm -hmm. is increasingly visible and increasingly unacceptable. Uh, I 
would venture to guess that every big city mayor and many others are wrestling with this. Uh, can you talk more about how the worlds of health and housing can work better mm -hmm. together to address this unacceptable crisis? And we have a lot of activity here that we want to discuss more with you. Absolutely. So, um, well, HUD does a number of things. I, I didn't bring up home ownership. I didn't bring up the Fair Housing Act because you told me only three. <laughs> <laughs> but, but these are also critical things that we do. But homelessness is, is really centers so much of the secretary and my time as well because it's so critical, because it's so visceral, and, and, and Americans see it and know that we have to act with urgency. So it's the reason why we've done um, some first of its kind um, initiatives. We have a unsheltered um, housing program. Mm -hmm. Typically we provide our grant funds to local homelessness agencies so that they can, you know, work with their shelter population, work with other homeless um, subpopulations. But we began to see more and more that there was an acute need inside of the unsheltered population. Mm -hmm. and, and these are the individuals that we see sadly on the streets. We see them in encampments. So we created a new program and provided $500 million mm -hmm. across the country to really direct energy to make sure that we were helping our unhoused neighbors who were on the streets. And we are just now beginning to see some of the, the impact of that work. It is, it is hard work, um, and, uh, but we're, we're proud of that and we're continuing to drive. In addition to that, we know that um, the Housing Choice Voucher Program, which HUD administers, is one that has played a critical role providing rental assistance to individuals, whether they are low income or, or they are uh, previously homeless. And so this administration has um, increased the voucher program with the help of, the, of Congress. We don't do it on our own. <laughs> um, we hope that Congress will give us even more money to do this, but we have um, increased the voucher program uh, more than it's been increased in the past couple decades. <laughs> And many of those vouchers are going toward um, our homeless uh, brothers and sisters across the country. Okay. Um, so so this, is, this is a labor of love, not just for HUD. Um, we work very closely with our colleagues at um, Health and Human Services, again, uh, USDA. Uh, we work very closely with uh, the US um, Interagency um, Council on Homelessness, mm -hmm. uh, USICH, mm -hmm. by, led by Jeff, a, right. a good friend of, 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 of ours. Right. And, um, and we're just continuing to drive this. You know, here's one of the things that we learned. Um, we know that the pandemic era relief um, helped many families, um, whether it was uh, our funds, whether it was Treasury State and Fiscal Recovery Funds, whether it was the, the child tax credit. We know what worked to keep people housed. And some of those securities are now gone. And, um, you know, we're beginning to see some of the impact of that across the country right. and, um, and some of the impact on public health as well. So thank you for your direct commitment to particularly the unsheltered homeless. That, that's uh, very important and all the other work you're doing. So our school is proud that we have a pilot initiative on health and homelessness, trying to bring all the worlds in, uh, together on this. And we're trying to encourage students and young leaders to commit to addressing this issue. We have a number in the room who have done that. We're, very, right. we're very, very proud of them, and we want to keep that going. So we're looking for best practices mm -hmm. about joining the worlds of uh, health and housing to address the, the homelessness crisis. Do, do you want to opine about that? In, in your work, what, what are some best practices you've seen? Yeah. In that area? You know, it is, um, it is always good when two systems try to <laughs> talk to each other. <laughs> um, housers, as we call ourselves, we have a whole <laughs> language. Um, that no one else understands, <laughs> except maybe Chris. <laughs> That's we, we, whole... we never have that in health. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't speak public health. I don't speak <laughs> health care. So the first thing that we've been doing is trying to make sure that HUD, HHS, we're working together to mm -hmm. understand right. our yeah. programs and our language. And we are driving those conversations at the state and local level as well. One of the most promising interventions is um, the Medicaid waiver opportunities good, good. Um, afforded by the ACA, which allows states to be able to, uh, uh, um, my word, repurpose um, Medicaid funds so that they're going to housing supports. And that can be 
paying for four months' rent or helping with housing search, just the, the whole canopy of things that help the most vulnerable as barriers to, to their successful tenancy. And so um, that is one great model. I know that here in Massachusetts right. um, has a tenured program, so good job, good job. And uh, you know, I think um, Arizona and, and some um, Oregon and Washington are some other areas to look at as well that have really used their Medicaid waiver ability to, to help really sync these two very complex systems. Those are great examples, and, and we are getting closer to the VA. I know HUD and the VA have had a long history of yes. trying to reduce veterans' homelessness. Do you want to talk more about that? So I, um, you know, I talked about some of the work that I've done um, two jobs ago. I had the opportunity mm -hmm. to work very closely with Veterans Affairs, the, the local VA medical center specifically, on ways that the housing agency and the medical center can work together. And the federal government has this extraordinary program that's called VASH that really needs to be replicated for, for really any homeless um, individual and family where we provide the opportunity to uh, pay rent. We receive funds from Congress to pay rent and the VA supports in terms of services and really um, acting as case managers for, for veterans who are homeless. Mm -hmm. It has been, um, for me, um, one of the most successful programs in the federal government, because not only has it helped house veterans and house them well, it's two agencies working together <laughs> to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and not just at the federal level, but at the local level um, as well. And so I think that is one area where, where um, we see the impact of intentionality around a population of homeless individuals, many of whom, um, be, by virtue of the fact that they presented themselves to the VA Medical Center, um, um, needed case management, needed services, and the housing is there, the case management is there, and it's, it, it just works. That's great, that's great. So one inescapable theme through all of this, of course, is uh, racial inequities and Indeed. racial disparities. Uh, you know, cost burden households are disproportionately households of color. There's a history of redlining in this country that uh, we're still trying to overcome. Mm -hmm. Do you want to comment more on that theme as you do your work at, at HUD? You know, uh, this president, day one, his, one of his first executive orders, if not the first, was centering this administration's work about making sure the people who need the federal government's help are the people who receive it. Um, and that is many vulnerable communities that's been left behind for generations. Mm -hmm. um, black and brown communities, low-income communities. So his executive order and equity centered much of how we have looked at deploying our programs. Mm -hmm. And don't get me started about Secretary Fudge. I don't know if anyone here has, has met the secretary. Mm -hmm. She is a force of nature. Mm -hmm. um, she makes no joke of making sure that HUD, not only that we are centering our programs towards folks who need it the most, but that we're talking and speaking and accessing those communities where they are. She started this concept of house parties. Um, you all know what a house party is. You're students. You know what a house party <laughs> is. Uh, she started this concept of house parties to really teach um, um, individuals about some of the home ownership opportunities that HUD has. You know, the FHA mortgage insurance has been a tool for first-time homeowners um, for a long time, but not everybody has accessed it. Many people feel it's, it, it's not something that they can attain. So she basically stood up this opportunity to really teach people where they are. In addition to that, we look at ways that we're deploying our vouchers. You know, we look at our fulfilling the dream of the Fair Housing Act. Um, what does that mean? That you know, we're all familiar with fair. Well, not all of us, but many of us are familiar with sort of the, the mission of fair housing, which is if someone is discriminated against anybody in the protected class, the Fair Housing Act is there to to protect them. Mm -hmm. But there's a piece of the Fair Housing Act that has not really been activated, and it has a fancy word, you're gonna write this down, affirmatively furthering fair housing. <laughs> affirmatively furthering fair housing, AFFH. <laughs> and that part of the Fair Housing Act is intended to say, look, there has been a 
history, not my opinion, not anybody's opinion, a history in this country of discrimination. And we still, the, the impact of that history still lingers right. in the way that our systems work. And so inside of the housing space, inside of the community development space, what can we do to collect for that X? So fair housing, if there's a bad landlord who says I'm not gonna rent to you because you're black or brown, the fair housing works well. But this little piece of the Fair Housing Act is much more aspirational, never been activated. And we provided our proposed rules on ways that we think we can activate that portion of the Fair Housing Act, and we're going to finish that job. Okay, great. AFFH. Okay, A remember that. That's another That's right. acronym for us. <laughs> so, Madam Secretary, in your travels around the country, you see a lot of innovation. Um, you mentioned Medicaid waivers and policies. You mentioned accessory dwelling units. Tell us more about the innovative practices, policies that you, that you think have a lot of promise for the future that yeah. we should all be tracking. Yeah. You know, we are um, dogged, particularly in our policy shop, of, of unearthing where there is, you know, um, just bursts of creativity, particularly mm -hmm. at the local level. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that we have taken on is really witnessing how many areas are um, being creative in pulling back barriers. I talked about poor housing and our, our program there. But California is doing, I think, a wonderful job statewide in looking at some of the barrier removals um, um, across that state, okay. which is, which is yeah. promising. Yeah. Um, we're also looking at different ways to, to build housing. You know, off-site construction um, is a fancy word for modular homes right, right. and for uh, tiny homes right. and for manufactured housing. And not manufactured housing that you know, some of you have probably seen on TV, and, but this is good quality housing that is low cost and less labor. Mm -hmm. uh, and for, the th for three years now, HUD has hosted um, an innovative housing showcase. I'm sure we'll do it again next summer. We welcome you down in June or July, mm -hmm. where we've actually had these homes on the mall. And we've had uh, a 3D printer. Um, we've had a number of different ADUs. We've had tiny homes. We've had beautiful uh, um, examples of modular housing. And there's lots of barriers to even accessing those because of some of the local rules. And really right. sort of the perception um, of this is lower quality homes. So we, we know that these opportunities are out there. Mm -hmm. um, we are continuing to dig up some best practices and just share them with the rest of the country. You know, building housing is really a community of practice. And, um, and we know mayors are always scrambling to outdo other mayors, and <laughs> housing agencies are always doing that, and, and, and HUD is certainly galvanizing and, and bringing them together and putting great ideas out there. Thank you. That sounds fascinating. We're going to watch that carefully with you. Yeah. <laughs> so I can't believe we only have a few minutes left. Oh we have a room full of students who are listening with great interest and are thinking possibly about a career in public service like you've had at multiple levels. Uh, so. Uh, in the last few minutes, do you want to share some thoughts about uh, a future in government or public service, uh, what you've learned and what you want to convey? You know, um, I've been in, in public service for most of my career, and the only break was my um, previous job, which I was the CEO of a national housing association. <laughs> And I remember sitting there and thinking, I'm done with this government stuff. I'm in the nonprofit world. You know, just this is, the, and here I am. Um, <laughs> because you put your passion to work in a way that you probably can't in any other sector of work, right? The things that, that, that I work on, the other members of the HUD team who are here work on, is impacting people's lives every single day in a broad way. Um, and that is intoxicating. Mm -hmm. It is something that I encourage everybody to, to grab a hold of at some point in your career. Um, public service is probably um, the most enriching thing I will do in my life other than my beautiful daughter, Maya, um, <laughs> and my husband and my parents. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but but it is it's powerful stuff and and here's and here's the thing um, HUD is always looking for great and brilliant minds um, the entire federal the, um, uh, the whole federal family is always looking for great um, wonderful minds and you don't have to spend a career there but spend some time with us 
um, you know, the this country is is reaching its promise, and it needs everybody on board to help it do that um, from from every walk of life. And if you have a promise and you believe in the things that you believe in, um, I think public service is one of the most powerful ways to put those beliefs at work. And so you can go to usajobs.gov. <laughs> um, I am sure there's a position there waiting for you, and, um, but certainly I welcome you selfishly to join us at the HUD team. Well, I can't think of a more inspiring, informed, uh, encouraging <laughs> way to uh, end this very too brief interview, uh, but uh, Madam Secretary, we're so lucky to have you in a leadership position in federal government at HUD. Please thank Secretary Fudge for us. I will. As well. Big I round will. of applause for the Deputy Secretary. Thank you. Well, thank you.